For almost as long as we've known about COVID, we've also known about long COVID, symptoms that last for weeks, months, or even years after the initial infection. And yet two years into the pandemic, there are still far more questions than answers about the condition. Last week, Virginia Senator Tim Kaine became the public face of long COVID, revealing he's suffered from symptoms since his diagnosis nearly two years ago. I have a lingering nerve tingling 24-7, uh, all over my body. I tell people it feels like all my nerves have had just like five cups of coffee and they're just like ready to go. And it kicked in at the start of COVID and it's never gone away. Researchers suggest anywhere from 5% to 50% of COVID survivors will still have lingering symptoms six months later, meaning somewhere between 4 and 40 million people in the U.S. with symptoms ranging from brain fog and confusion to debilitating fatigue, lung issues, heart problems, and more. Last month, the National Institutes of Health launched 15 different collaborations aimed at studying long COVID, including one here in Boston, where a consortium of six hospitals led by Brigham and Women's has started recruiting patients for a three-year project. Among those patients is Cassandra Cast, who joins me now, along with Dr. Bruce Levy, Chief of Brigham and Women's Pulmonary Division and the Principal Investigator of this Boston study. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for being here. Thank you Thank for you. having me. Thank you very much. Doctor, what's the goal? Uh, treatment, prevention, what? What do you hope to come up with at the end of three years? Well, as you mentioned right off the top, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. And so we need to address those. And the initial purpose of the Recover Initiative uh, is to start to address some of those and get some answers. What's the full clinical spectrum of long COVID? What are risk factors for developing it? And get some insights, I might say, into the underlying biology, the underlying mechanisms that are causing people so much suffering. The idea then would be to quickly follow up with targeted rational therapeutic trials of new treatments, new treatment approaches. But first, it's mostly an observational study that we're in right now. Doctor, my understanding is your intention is to take into account the disproportionate impact on people of color that COVID itself has had in the long COVID study. How do you propose to do that? That's absolutely right. Uh, it's very important to us here in Boston and nationally that we have a representative cohort of all those who have suffered so much from the acute infection from COVID. And that's of course disproportionately impacted our communities of color, black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. So we're, we have community-based efforts and we're partnering with the community and community organizations to develop a community partnership table so that we can really have bi-directional uh, education so we can learn, but also we can bring education to the community. And our goal is actually over-representing the number of people, the cohort that we uh -huh. recruit here in Boston uh, with black, African-American, Hispanic uh, uh, individuals. Cassandra, my understanding is you go to your father's funeral in October of 2020, and the next couple of months, you're on a ventilator for a significant period of time. You suffer from kidney failure, yet you remember none of that at all. Is that correct? That's correct. I remember the last thing I remember is being at my father's funeral in Memphis, Tennessee. And then um, my first recollection, for some reason, the date of December 13th stands out. And I didn't come home until December 21st. And I remember nothing in between. It was devastating. So from December 13th or the 21st till today, however many months, that is 15th or some, 15 or something like that, what yeah. have you experienced? What have you suffered from, Cassandra? Um, I, ex I severely suffer, I suffer severely from extreme fatigue. Um, there's a lot of brain fog. I still have motion issues with my right arm. Um, not exactly sure whether that was from positioning or whether it was from um, the effects of COVID. Uh, when I first came home, I could not walk because I had been sedated for so long. So it, it affects my everyday life. I can't do a lot of the things that I generally do. Um, and it's, it's very hard and I'm so excited to be a part of this study because it's so important. People think that you just kind of make it up, but you don't have a choice. You, there's things that you can't, I literally simply doing laundry takes all of my breath. 
Um, were you a pretty, so were you, Cassandra, were you a pretty healthy person before that, your father's funeral, before you contracted yes. COVID? You were, yeah. Yes. Doctor, yes. we mentioned at the top, both you and I, how little we know or how much we still need to know. For starters, what is long COVID? How are you defining it for purposes of this research? So it's really a term meant to capture the long-term consequences of having had the infection. And we think that anything before 30 days is still too closely tied to the, the current infection. So long COVID would begin 30 days after the diagnosis of an infection if people happen to have symptoms or disability as uh, Ms. Cass has, uh, you know, after 30 days. And we know that many people suffer for months and now even years um, with persistent symptoms. But long COVID is really meant to capture symptoms that should have gone away within uh -huh. the first 30 days that haven't. Do we even know who's more likely to get it? For example, are you more likely to get long COVID if you're unvaccinated rather than vaccinated? Or do we not even know that yet? Well, there is some really interesting data that's coming out, in, including some data that just came out within the last couple of weeks about risk factors. We're still learning. And these, what I'm about to share with you needs to be replicated. But there are a few risk factors that have emerged, one of which is related to the extent of the infection. So vaccinated people uh, don't have as severe an infection. And so that's one possible way people can try to prevent getting uh, long COVID. Another is the presence of type two diabetes. It appears that for some reason that is presenting itself as an important risk factor for the development of mm -hmm. long COVID. The third is actually at the time of diagnosis with COVID to actually have circulating levels of the EBV, the Epstein-Barr virus, uh -huh. which is the mononucleosis virus. And everybody knows that one of the main symptoms with mono is extreme fatigue. Yeah. And why the COVID virus seems to reactivate uh, the mono virus is unclear. That needs further research. But it's potentially a window into a therapeutic approach to try to address that. Cassandra Kest, have you lost, have there been periods during this, you described the physical symptoms, have there been periods during these 15 months, whatever it is, where you've lost hope of ever coming out the other side of this? Yes, it's very hard because this is not who I am. And when you can't do simple things around your own home, um, it can be very, very um, heart-wrenching, depressing also. And, and you said before how glad you are to be a part of this study. Is this what you're hanging your hope on, that there is another healthier, Absolutely. safer, happier life for you? Absolutely. I, I just have to believe that I'm here for a reason. And I want them to ask as many questions and study as much as possible because it's heart-wrenching when you can't walk from your kitchen to your living room. And this study hopefully will really show um, why and how and how to change that. And I'm really glad to be um, a woman of color for that, for the diverse population. Well, I hope it's as successful as you hope, Cassandra Kest, for you and millions of others. And Bruce Levy, okay. thank you so much for your time. Good luck. We'll stay in touch with both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.